to present our work. Good afternoon. Everybody, today I will talk about Ladis Boltzmann simulations of non equilibrium fluctuations in a non ideal binary mixture from a work of Mauro Sbragaglia, Roberto Benzi, Sergio Ciliberto, and me. Uh, well, the, the missing affiliation beside my name is not a typo, as I'm actually looking for a position. Whereas this work refers to the period of my postdoc at the University of Rome, Torbegada. Let me briefly introduce the underlying framework. Uh, so thermal fluctuations are essential ingredients for a proper descriptions. Uh, for a proper description of hydrodynamical systems at small scale of observation. And a background thermodynamic uh, equilibrium state is usually assumed, which allows the application of, uh, of a fluctuation dissipation theorem. However, this approach is inappropriate in presence of background temperature or concentration gradients, even with mechanical equilibrium. Fortunately, the theory can be extended to those, to those cases. In particular, we considered the case of a binary mixture in the presence of a constant concentration gradient. As we will see, non-equilibrium fluctuations cause long-range correlation effects, which are absent in equilibrium situations, except uh, close to criticality. Moreover, the long-range nature of uh, non-equilibrium effects cause fluctuation-induced forces, as extensively discussed in the literature, in particular in the works of Kirkpatrick, Ortiz de Zarate, and Sengas. Um, the idea of including thermal fluctuations in Ladis Boltzmann has constituted an active research field of the recent years, and in particular, in this paper here, we discussed how to proper formulate noise in multi-component systems, even in presence of inhomogeneous background concentration. Uh, our aim today is to explore the applicability of the fluctuation lattice Boltzmann described here in this paper in the context of non-equilibrium fluctuations. So, let us consider a two-dimensional binary uh, mixture confined between two walls separated by a distance L. And suppose the whole system be immersed in a thermostat at temperature T. Then it reaches a stationary state fluctuating around a homogeneous background equilibrium. Um, well, there is no gravity here, so the background is homogeneous. This situation is, is well described by the fluctuating Navier-Stokes equations for binary mixture, where j and pi here are the stochastic contributions to the corresponding deterministic equations. Uh, they are related to the transport coefficients d and u via the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Um, by then, one usually by let me see, by linearizing with respect to a homogeneous background and applying the fluctuation dissipation theorem, one obtains the structure factors for the hydrodynamical fields, in particular for the concentration, which result to be independent of the wave vector Q. Now let us return to our picture and suppose to have a constant gradient in the concentration profile. The stationary state now fluctuates around the non-homogeneous background, which is a state of non-equilibrium in thermodynamical sense, even if mechanical equilibrium is still preserved. What changes in the mathematical description? Actually, the only change in the equation is in this term here, where C0 denotes the, bang, the background concentration profile uh, with constant uh, concentration gradient. But it causes a dramatical, dramatical change in the concentration structure factor. In uh, 
um, in, in the direction, uh, sorry, for wave vectors in the dire direction perpendicular to the background concentration, uh, concentration gradient. So, um, well, in, in, in general, um, the non-equilibrium effects are promoted by two main sources. One is the spatial inhomogeneity of the thermal noise in the fluctuation dissipation here uh, through the density or the, the temperature in, in other cases, while another source can be identified in the mode coupling between fluctuating velocity and concentration caused by this term here in the equation, in the, in the equation of motion, uh, which is non-vanishing at linear order. Typically, the effect induced by inhomogeneity of the noise as small and hence neglected, right? So this behavior in the direction, this behavior here at, uh, uh, at um, a small scale uh, in the direction perpendicular to the gradient of the concentration is entirely caused by the mode coupling. And our fluctuating lattice Boltzmann algorithm is capable of catching this feature. So let us come back again to our picture and now discretize the space in a two-dimensional lattice. This actually means that each lattice side represents a portion of, of space in which the fluid properties as, are basically constant, right? However, each side contains pieces of information of the mesoscopic world, as many as the, the desired degree of precision is high. In this case, a nine velocity lattice Boltzmann is sufficient. So our lattice Boltzmann algorithm is then described by an equation of this form for the mass distributions F0 to F8, where RL here is the responsible for the change of uh, the health distribution when moving along the link VL in a, in a time step. Well, I, I prepared a couple of slides to sketch how the lattice Boltzmann works, but I think, definitely think I can safely skip them. Let just me remark that we are dealing with multi-component fluids. So in this case, uh, basically nothing changes except that now each quantity uh, refers to the species, right? So in our case, is the, 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 the species S. So in our case, S can be the green species or the blue species, but, but in principle, you can have more than two species. But uh, the hydrodynamics, hydrodynamics is recovered by suitably, suitably, suitably defining the relevant fields in terms of uh, the lattice Boltzmann distributions. In particular, the expression for the velocity there, <coughs> there uh, sorry, in the, in the expression of the velocity, there are corrections due to the body force contributions of this form. Here, the first terms uh, model the non-ideal character of the mixture, Alashan Chen, with an intensity parameterized by uh, this prefactor here, G, and they give the non-ideal contribution to the, to, the, to the equation of state for the pressure. The second terms instead are the responsible for the background concentration gradient in, uh, in the evolution equation for the concentration and do not affect momentum balance since they sum up to zero uh, without entering uh, sorry without entering the details i only mentioned that rsl must take into account for three contribution uh, a standard collisional term which in our case is, is a multiple relaxation time operator a forcing term which uh, uh, is a linear function of the respective body force density and take into account long-range interactions, 
and a noise term which is responsible for the emerging of the stochastic contribution j and pi. The Xi S L are zero mean Gaussian random variables whose variances can be defined mode by mode. And the only non-vanishing noise correlations are in uh, momentum modes and for uh, in um, modes of higher order. And the, the, the derivation of these noises, these noise correlations, is an interesting application for the, of the fluctuating uh, dissipation theorem at kinetic level and, and can be uh, found in this paper here. So, before looking at the results of our fluctuating Ladis Boltzmann machinery, let me notice that these noise correlations would depend, in principle, on space through their uh, dependence on the background fields. Uh, however, to focus on the mod coupling effects, um, <clears throat> we are um, we uh, for, for, um, in order to focus on the mod coupling effects, which are responsible for this behavior for the concentration structure factor we mainly performed simulations by keeping them uh, the, the background concentration in the noise correlations equal to the reference values i will turn back uh, to this point later which is an important point uh, now uh, after uh, checking that in equilibrium all works fine, we fixed the parameters, as in the purple case here, and turned on the non-equilibrium fluctuations. In this case, the structure factors, the concentration structure factor, becomes strongly anisotropic and anisotropic and mode dependent. Well, to characterize such non-equilibrium fluctuations, we use this decomposition here and look at the behavior of the product of this product, which is the non-equilibrium correction to the equilibrium value at, at, uh, at small scales, so uh, at large values of the normalized, uh, of the basically of the wave, uh, wave vector. Uh, the results we found are in perfect agreement with the expected power law behavior, as we can see here for different values of the background concentration gradient, here for different values of the wall-to-wall -wall distance L, and here for different values of the kinematic viscosity nu. Um, Regarding this point, the dependence on the viscosity is more subtle than how it appears here. Indeed, the importance of the mode coupling with respect to the inhomogeneity of noise um, depends on the transport coefficients nu and d, as in the factor phi here. Uh, we reported here the ratio between S tilde computed by implementing the noise using homogeneous reference values for, um, for the background fields and the same quantity obtained using the true local values of the densities. And we see that when both the transport coefficients are small, the two simulations provide uh, uh, the same results. Instead, by increasing both uh, d and nu, the noise inhomogeneity becomes more and more important. Uh, in any case, at large scales, we observe here uh, that the power law scaling becomes progressively underestimated. Indeed, uh, due to the long-range uh, long long nature of the non-equilibrium fluctuations, 
the structure factors depends at large scale on the boundary conditions, right? So we fixed again uh, our attention to the purple plot here and tested different analytical solutions corresponding to different boundary conditions at the walls. Uh, the solution that better fits the data reported here corresponds to no slip conditions for the velocity here and uh, uh, conducting a uh, conducting condition for the concentration which basically means that both of them do not fluctuate in contact with the walls even in presence of thermal fluctuations in any case the long range nature of non equilibrium fluctuations can be highlighted by looking at the two point correlation function in real space where the variable uh, below here rounds z, the variable z here, rounds in the wall to wall direction. Indeed, for the concentration, which is again the purple plot here, we see a correlation length that essentially spans uh, the whole system size. Well, recent works supported the fact that this long range effects. This uh, this caused by um, a non-equilibrium Casimir, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the non-equilibrium uh, uh, fluctuations cause a non-equilibrium Casimir pressure. That is a non-equilibrium contribution to pressure like uh, uh, Casimir forces, and the rationale behind this effect hinges uh, on the connection between the pressure and the concentration fluctuations. So in, um, in a nutshell, um, just, to, just to sketch the idea, the local equilibrium assumption and, uh, and the presence of mechanical equilibrium in average lead to a non-equilibrium contribution to the pressure of this form where the, the, basically the, the, the variance of the concentration appears, only the non-equilibrium contribution of the variance of the, uh, the, the concentration fluctuations. And um, the resulting non-equilibrium pressure may be space dependent. And one may, and one may uh, wonder how this could be reconciled with an average mechanical balance, right? Where uh, one is expects that the pressure is constant. Indeed, the, the total pressure is constant and the mechanism of compensation is, uh, is a sort of non-equilibrium renormalization of the background profile density um, in such a way that the total average, average pressure is constant. So we tested directly this property and confirmed the above view. Specifically we, specifically, we see here that the total pressure of a non-ideal binary mixture receives a correction by thermal fluctuations, but is still homogeneous in space, while the average density profile changes accordingly. And to make further progress, uh, we wanted to, to study the scaling properties of the non-equilibrium Casimir pressure. And to this aim, we plot here the measured spatial average of the non-equilibrium pressure as a function of the background concentration gradient and the wall-to-wall -wall distance. Uh, well, such behaviors um, are, are, are found to be in agreement with the theoretical predictions available in the literature. Uh, I think uh, my time is finished. I have, uh, well, I, I just uh, want to 
to summarize, uh, uh, to, to, to conclude, um, we applied the fluctuating Ladis-Boltzmann myth, Ladis myth, uh, methodology, methodology to a system out of thermodynamic equilibrium, a binary mixture confined between two parallel walls in presence of a constant concentration gradient in the wall-to-wall -wall direction. We studied structure factors and spatial correlations of the velocity and concentration fluctuations and found good agreement with the theoretical predictions of fluctuating hydrodynamics. And we further ex inspected the behavior of the resulting non-equilibrium pressure as a function of both the concentration gradient and the wall-to-wall -wall distance and verified the correctness, the correctness of the corresponding expected scaling lows <clears throat> in agreement with the constant average total pressure. And the results here reported naturally warrant other future uh, quantitative studies. For example, in the context of Ladis Boltzmann methodology, the analysis of the structure factors revealed the necessity of a better, better control in implementing the boundary condition uh, in presence of thermal fluctuations, or the extension of the Chapman ex, uh, um, expansion to the fluctuating case, for example, is missing. And in this case, the results of this paper support the convergence of fluctuating lattice Boltzmann towards fluctuating hydrodynamics. While in the context of fantasides effects in the non-equilibrium fluctuations, it would be interesting to further inspect the importance of compressibility effects uh, for analytical solutions in presence of confinement. Finally, as uh, the lattice Boltzmann metho methodology has proven capable of <coughs> versatility in the simulation of colloidal particles, it could be insightful to design experiments involving colloidal particles exhibiting, ex exhibiting a mechanical chemical coupling with the fluid in such a way that non-equilibrium fluctuations effects can be indirectly reconstructed and studied from the particle trajectory. So I concluded, thanks for for your attention and I remain remain available for any questions. Thank you for the talk. Uh, let's open it up for a question. <clears throat> if there are one or two quick questions. Um, I I had one question. So you observed this interesting concentration, well, wall-induced, um, I guess, enrichment in your case of, of density, right? Sorry? Um, is that observed experimentally at all? So you observed this density, so the total density to, to balance out the pressure now became yeah. dependent on, on the distance from the wall, right? And so the, the question is, does this density enrichment at the wall, is that observed experimentally or is it something that just comes out of the theory at this point? Uh, surely, theoretically, is, uh, is, uh, is derived uh, in, um, in, in the works of Kirkpatrick and, uh, and uh, et al. Uh, we found it uh, numerically and experimentally I'm not sure since these effects um, seems to be, I mean, uh, they are difficult to, to, to catch some of them. You see also here in this plot that the density profile slightly change. So it is anyway basically uh, constant. The system is not exactly compressible the fluid is not exactly compressible compressible but almost right so. yeah thank you um and if you make your wall further apart then basically this effect 
becomes very small, is that right? Because the gradients become very small. Yeah. There's no there's no finite distance to the wall where this matters. It's just stretches throughout the whole system, or, or would that be concentrated as the walls at some point, the effect? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Okay, any other questions? And let's thank Danielle again for a very nice talk. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next speaker, Matthias. Okay. Okay, setting up perfect. Okay. Um, so he'll tell us about, yes, flows through time evolving porous medium, the role of swelling and erosion. Um, I'll just uh, pass it by on to you, Andre. Thank you very much. Hopefully, everyone hears me and everyone can see my screen. Yep. So. Well. So uh, as, as Alexander said, uh, I'm going to talk about the photo time involving porous medium. I'm a PhD student at, at, at CFTC from the University of Lisbon. And, uh, and uh, I'll start my presentation with some, with some uh, definitions about, uh, uh, because I think they are important to understand my work. So start, start by the, the subject of the, of the, of the of the study, which is the porous medium. So a porous medium is a is a, is an object that's composed of two things. Firstly, there is a, there is a solid matrix, and in between the solid matrix, uh, there are empty spaces called pores. And in these pores, and these pores can be filled with with the fluids. It can be, for example, air, water, or uh, other types of fluids. Examples of porous media can be, for example, cork. And the cork is a particular example of porous media because the pores are not interconnected between them. And so this means that if we put the fluid on top of the cork, it cannot percolate through the, through the medium to the other side. And this makes cork a very good insulator, as we see on our wine bottles. Other examples of porous media are, for example, in our kidneys. In our kidneys, we have a, a, a porous medium that helps our body to filtrate the impurities that are present on our blood. In this case, in this case, the porous medium uh, now has uh, most of the pores connected with each other. This means that a, a, a fluid can percolate the kidney from one side to the other and accomplish filtration in, in between. And lastly, two more examples about porous medium. These two, the la these last two, are extensively uh, uh, studied in academia. The first one is an oil reservoir, which is which is uh, uh, the which is known that the oil uh, that is beneath our feet is stored is stored in a porous medium, and uh, and we need to understand the properties of the porous medium that stores the oil in order to efficiently extract as much oil and as pure oil as possible. And finally, uh, we have an example that the water that falls down uh, on our streets due to rain will percolate the ground and will end up on aquifers beneath our feet. And in these aquifers, the water will flow uh, away into a river or into the ocean, for example. This, this, these last two examples of porous media are particularly interesting because they have properties that uh, the, the flow changes the, the, the porous medium and the porous medium changes the flow, like this. So, for example, in the aquifer, in the, aquifer uh, the ground contains uh, some clay, and the clay in contact with, the, with water will absorb some water and this absorption will cause the particles of clay to swell. And obviously the swell of the, of the clay particles will change the, the properties of the porous media, which in, uh, in consequence will affect the properties of the flow. Another thing that we are interested in is erosion. So back to the example of the old reservoirs, as we uh, extract the, as we force the oil out of the porous medium, the shear stress that the oil induces on the ground is enough to uh, to remove parts of the ground and and transport it with with the flow of the oil, and the, uh, these pieces of ground can can then end up on the on the oil res on the on the extracted oil which we don't want, and so in this presentation I will discuss a little bit how these two phenomena affect the the flow the flow of a fluid in a porous medium. 
to do so, I implemented uh, I implemented lattice Boltzmann method on one of the simplest uh, lattice that there is, which is the D3Q19. And because I'm interested in laminar flow, my relaxation time is is uh, is fairly small, not 0.8. Because uh, because I'm dealing with porous medium and the location of the boundaries of the of the medium is very important. Instead of using the BGK, BGK collision operator, I instead use the two relaxation time collision operator. This way, the location of the boundary does not depend on the viscosity of the fluid. An additional measure that I took uh, in order to have control about the position of the boundary was that I used ghost, uh, maze, uh, maze ghost nodes method in order to interpolate, interpolate what is the, dis uh, the distributions on the wall. And this way, I can have a wall that is located somewhere in between the two nodes instead of having the boundary fixed as halfway the uh, halfway the boundaries, like uh, like the more simple example of the halfway bounce back uh, approach. Another important thing to 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 refer is that uh, my fluid is set into motion with a pressure gradient, and this pressure gradient is imposed by assuming that the fluid is slightly compressible. And so I have an inlet density uh, of the fluid, an outlet density of the fluid, and the, uh, the pressure gradient is related to the difference between the two densities. So this, these are the general uh, technical details about the algorithm now the, uh, regarding the specific ones. So how did I implement swelling? I'll start with how, how I implemented swelling. So experimentally, it, it was measured that uh, coffee grains in contact with water absorb water, and in the process of absorbing water, they they increase their size. And it is reported that the final size of the coffee beans can be twice as big as the initial size. Furthermore, furthermore, it was found that the the volume increase of the uh, coffee beans is well is well uh, adjusted by this expression, this analytical expression, which is the result of assuming that water is absorbed on the surface. Because I have an infinite sum here, which does not go well with numerical simulations, I simplified the expression, and now I only have two free parameters, alpha parameter, which controls the final volume of the particles, and a, sw uh, a, a swelling time scale, which controls how fast the, the swelling uh, the swelling occurs. Because because these these two equations relate to microscopic properties such as the the full volume of the grain and lattice Boltzmann is a method that discretizes space. I need to somehow discretize this equation, and I do so by assuming that swelling. Uh, uh, causes a, a uniform shell to 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 appear around the, around the particle, and this uniform shell has an height h that I can calculate using the variation in volume of the particle and the total variation in volume of the particle and the surface area of the particle. And so to discretize it, I simply take the the volume of the particle and the surface area of the particle, and then convert it to the uh, variation in volume of the nodes, which is the information that we want, and the surface area of the nodes. I, I need to 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 do some bench to validate my algorithm, and to do so, I simulated the flow on a BCC lattice. And uh, I uh, choose the BCC lattice because in this in this example we can we know how uh, how is the drag uh, on each sphere due to the fluid flow, and with the drag I I can determine analytically what is the the flow rate as function of the radius of the particle, and that is what I plotted here, as function of time. So in blue I have the flow rate as in, as function of time. Remember that the sizes of the particles are in, is increasing over time. And the points correspond to the uh, simulation uh, to the points obtained from the lattice Boltzmann simulations. As we increase the uh, the swelling time scale, we get closer and closer to the and uh, to the expected value, because uh, the boundaries are 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 evolving slower and slower, which means that every, at every time step we get that the fluid is completely re relaxed. So this uh, summarizes swelling. What about erosion? So experimental reports show that show that the variation in mass uh, the uh, the variation in mass due to erosion is proportional to the uh, to the shear stress on the surface of the particle this shear stress this tw 
with the constant proportion, uh, proportionality of uh, KER. Furthermore, they, uh, experimentally, they also found out that, that there is a threshold below which no erosion happens. And so this erosion threshold, this TER, uh, the shear stress, TW, needs to be above TER in order for erosion to happen. I also did some validation uh, regarding erosion, and to do so, I simulated the flow on a tube. I simulated the flow on the tube because this way we know how the velocity profile is and we know what is the, the shear stress around the tube and combining the expression for the shear stress and the expression for the variation in mass, I can determine that the radius of the tube evolves exponentially in time. And so once again, in blue, it's the analytical result uh, plotted and, and the points correspond to, the, to my simulation data and uh, once again, as I decrease the uh, as I decrease the the erosion rate, that is, we, I make the boundaries to vary slower. I get closer and closer to the expected value that is on the blue line. So these are the these are the two phenomena working uh, separately. But how do they work uh, in in conjunction? So just to recap, if I have a parallel plates and I have a fluid flow in the middle, if I only have swelling then the, 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 the plates will grow and the, the gap will decrease until it reaches the maximum size that I will mark with the dashed line. If I only have erosion, then the, uh, the length of, of the gap will increase exponentially until we reach uh, some nodes that I uh, 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 designed such that they cannot be eroded. And so uh, the, the simulation always stops when we reach those nodes which I will mark once again with a dashed line. So the, the, the parallel pipes needs to be somewhere in between these dashed lines. So if we have the two things, in, the two phenomena in conjunction, let's focus here on the orange line, which, which plots the amount of mass as function of time. In this image, the amount of red as function of time. And we see that in the beginning, we have an increase in mass due to the absorption of water. And eventually the swelling will stabilize Enough such that the erosion now is the relevant, uh, the relevant uh, um, phenomenon, and so the the mass will decrease uh, exponentially fast until we reach the minimum mass allowed. Okay, so uh, just a heads up. In these simulations, I, I did not put an erosion threshold to simplify the system, but when I put an, an erosion threshold, something interesting happened because. When I put an erosion threshold, if the erosion threshold is very small, this is the expression for, uh, to, to be reminded, if the erosion threshold is very small, then uh, it is irrelevant to the behavior of the system. So once again, the blue line, it decreases a bit in the beginning, and then it decreases until it reaches the minimum mass possible. If my erosion threshold is very large, then uh, I, I, the system never erodes. And so I get that the system, uh, the mass of the system increases until it reaches the maximum size, which corresponds to uh, only swelling. But if I have an erosion threshold in the middle, I can have a situation like this. So, because the, the shear stress is proportional to the length of the of the gap, I have a limit gap uh, um, that is uh, the limit uh, uh, below which no erosion happens. And so the orange line happens as follows. The system is swelling and eroding until it reaches the, the, the limit gap. And when it reaches the limit gap, the erosion needs to stop because the shear stress is now too small. But the system continues to swell a little bit. And so, and so the final state is somewhere in between completely erosion and, and no erosion. I can systematically plot uh, the final state of the system the final state of the system by plotting the uh, amount of the efficiency of mass removal. So if I have 100% efficiency, it is like the blue line where I remove all of the mass. If I have 0% efficiency, it's like the green line where the system only swells. And so as I increase the, sh uh, the erosion threshold, there is a value above which the, uh, the efficiency drops to close to zero and eventually it will reach zero. If I decrease the, the, the swelling time scale, uh, then the, 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 the grains swell faster 
which means that there is less time for erosion to happen in between the swelling. And so we, this, this means that, that my, my drop to 0% to efficiency uh, happens at uh, smaller and smaller erosion thresholds. So just to conclude uh, uh, and to give some outlook, uh, this is for a very simple system where I have simply parallel plates. We are currently working uh, to, to try to understand the same behavior on a more complex medium like this one where we, are, we have multiple spheres or this one where we have a, a, a flow in three dimensions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the talk, very nice. Um, let's open it up to some quick questions. I actually had a, I had a question. Um, so this is very nice work on, on swelling and erosion. Um, at this point, you have this uh, erosion threshold that, uh, if I saw this right, does not depend on the amount of swelling that's happened, but just knowing nothing about it, but just you know, experience with coffee grains. And so typically you find that small materials are much less structurally stable. And would that imply that eventually you would want to make the erosion threshold or the erosion rate dependent on the degree of swelling that's, that's present? So that uh, that is an, uh, an interesting question um, that uh, some work would need to go into that, but my guess would go to that uh, overall the behavior of the system would be the same uh, because because in the end uh, because in the end let me just put on the slide so you're saying that as the particle swells it gets easier and easier for it to erode because because uh, uh, because it structurally the material is weaker that uh, yes. that will that will be uh, something interesting to do, but I guess the overall behavior will be the same because erosion uh, 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 makes the system evolve exponentially. So so that uh, making the material structurally weaker will, will only accelerate the the behavior. So we will most likely have uh, the same the same behavior the same behavior at this spot. So some, some values of er uh, erosion threshold, 100% efficiency and some value 0% efficiency. But I guess that will only shift this, uh, the drop further to the right or to the left. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If that's not the case, let's thank Andrew again. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess now we're supposed to have a coffee break, uh, but I would suggest, since we're a little bit behind schedule, uh, we make this a, a sort of eight minute coffee break and start back. Uh, I'm a PhD student right now. Okay, so he's a, he's a graduate student with uh, uh, Matthias Krause in the Karlsruhe Institute of, Te of Technology. Um, and he'll tell us today about the investigation of particle detachments in wall flow filters, uh, employing the particle simulation. And uh, I guess without further ado, I'll just pass it over to you. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Nicholas Hafen. This is the first time I'm actually at the DSFD, so I'm very happy to be able to share my work here. And uh, my talk will be a little bit more on the uh, application side um, because I'm interested in the investigation of the particle detachments. And um, I'm using uh, resolved particle simulations for that. So let me briefly go over um, motivation for that. Um, so wall flow filters are usually used for uh, particle separation from the exhaust of uh, combustion engines. And mainly currently they're used for uh, diesel particulate filters. However, they can be used for different um, filtering operations as well. Um, on the right-hand side, you can already see um, a close-up of that. Um, we see a few inlet channels um, closed uh, um, open channels and uh, closed channels, which are outlet channels, um, which represent this uh, opposedly arranged inflow and outflow channels here, um, where you have a porous wall between them, um, where the fluid is actually forced through. Um, and uh, this uh, operation of the filters works usually in uh, two, sta uh, two stasi stages. 
you have a loading stage where um, particulate matter deposits in the filter wall, um, and that forms a big um, and thick layer in there, which then of course clogs the filter somehow, um, which is why the filter has to be um, oxidized afterwards um, to remove this um, clogging. So um, what you can actually think of um, this, um, this process is as a layer breakup at first, um, where this uh, thick layer gets um, fragmented into smaller pieces, and you have the resuspension um, of the small uh, pieces into the flow. Um, also, um, they need to overcome the adherence first. Um, and then you have the plug for formation eventually when all the particles again um, are um, yeah, clustering again somewhere in the channel. So we're interested in this um, whole process and um, we're using that with resolved uh, particle simulations, um, specifically with the homogenized lattice Boltzmann method, um, which um, I'm not actually going to talk about the homogenization uh, too much, but uh, about the application of that method. So um, what we're doing is we want to evaluate the hydrodynamic forces uh, on individual particles and um, the particulate matter um, layer fractions. Uh, we want to calculate the force distribution of um, those fragmented um, layers. And of course, in total, uh, have this um, detachment, free suspension, and um, plug formation afterwards. And um, that is all in order to, um, to, to answer this question um, that we actually want to systematically trace back the uh, operating behavior to relevant pa parameters in, in engineering context and that independent of uh, engine applications. So um, starting with the uh, uh, modeling, um, what we used here um, was a very simple uh, porous media model, not like the one from uh, Andre and uh, Rodrigo, um, because we're just, uh, we're actually not um, resolving it at all. Um, so because we can assume a laminar creeping flow, um, because the channels are actually very large, so the flow that goes through it is, um, or the velocity of it is, is uh, rather small. Um, we're just using a very simple model, um, the one from Spade and Feeling that used uh, a basic forcing um, based on the Shen Shen version of it. And um, assuming this uh, general of the different forcings, um, we don't have a forcing, um, like a, a source term there, but just based on the force that is introduced, which then goes into the um, equilibrium um, distribution function. So um, in order to model this force um, in the spade and filament um, approach, um, it is just seen as um, a velocity that can be scaled with this uh, parameter beta, uh, which is, um, is like a momentum sink that can be, uh, or that, that uh, depends on the uh, viscosity and the permeability. Um, and what you can see in the equation five is that, um, uh, so their result, um, efficient uh, viscosity, uh, efficient velocity, um, that we can actually use um, with this uh, confined permeability D, which just scales uh, the, the velocity, so we get this effective um, um, velocity here. Um, however, we need to, of course, be um, aware of the restrictions for this D, um, as we need to confine it from one to zero to one, and to be sure that there is no flow actually flowing back in that direction. Um, so we also have some um, dependency on the actually on the simulation setup. So having said that, of course, we want to actually simulate a moving porous media um, next to the wall that uh, we want to model as a porous medium. And for that, we use uh, as a general approach the um, partially saturated method. But um, ex like uh, contrary to the conventional methods where um, there's a weighting factor that is actually weighting between different collision operators, we're uh, adding a body force, um, assuming a, porous, uh, a moving porous medium. So this is also why uh, the static porous medium um, was introduced before. And um, as conventional PSMs, we need a local weighting factor for that. And um, this weighting factor can um, directly be connected to the confined permeability. There are different uh, versions of it that you can find in literature. Um, we're going for this uh, B1 formulation, so we're directly connecting it to it. However, um, in case we want to simulate 
permeal particles, so movable permeal particles, we can't just use this um, confined permeability um, as a distinguishing um, uh, parameter between the solid areas and um, the areas which don't occupy any uh, porosity. So we need to introduce another um, um, parameter, this order parameter phi, uh, which we can use as a continuous uh, description of a particle volume fraction approximation. That, of course, for uh, impermeable particle is the same as the uh, confined permeability itself. Um, when having that, um, we, um, or actually we get that um, from uh, smoothing this function because uh, we want to have a, we don't want to have a, a step function that would lead to uh, fluctuations and numerical errors. So um, for a circular cylinder, we can see this uh, formulation down there, which goes from zero to one, of course, um, and in that case with a, a cosinus. And um, as we see on the right-hand side, um, we can now map this order parameter phi to uh, the confined permeability. For example, if we have uh, solids that are having a physical uh, permeability that leads to this confined permeability of 0 0.8. And um, we can also map that to the porosity in case we're using a model that would um, um, make it mandatory to distinguish between the porosity or the permeability itself. Um, so with having that, um, we can actually go into uh, take our weighting, which is connected to the confined permeability, which is then connected to uh, the order parameter, um, and uh, calculate the effective velocity by just uh, using a weighted average of the fluid and the solid velocities. And that formulation is um, pretty similar to the one you have in conventional PSMs where you're um, weighting the uh, collision operator. So. Uh, of course, in the end, we somehow need to include our effective velocity into the uh, lattice Boltzmann equation. And we do that by uh, the uh, forcing proposed by Cooper Stokes, so just by um, adding another source term uh, into the LVE. So with this um, framework, we have, uh, we're already um, able to calculate the fluid flow, also the um, reduction of the uh, momentum due to the porous medium. But of course, we still want to um, be able to move particles around. Um, for that, we are um, using the momentum exchange approach. Um, so we're just calculating um, the force contribution on the boundary nodes in the transition region of um, phi, and then um, summing it up over all the boundary nodes um, and getting a force and a torque that uh, is acting on the um, mass, uh, the center of mass from, um, from each particle. And uh, afterwards, we're just using some simple discrete element method um, to um, yeah, move it around in the, um, in the channel. So um, coming to the results, the first thing we're, uh, we're um, looking at was a periodic model um, where we just have one inflow channel in the middle and another one um, split up into uh, the four corners. And um, we have the bottom and the top left and right walls um, as periodic walls. and um, also, the, the whole channel is, um, the, the, the length is reduced by a factor of 10, which of course doesn't give us uh, a physical uh, pressure. However, we can already see um, where we have this consistent velocity profile. Uh, so this is just what you see on the left-hand side. But um, of course, we're interested in the actual pressure. So what we did was uh, we just took this um, uh, channels and we put some planes in there. Uh, and calculate the um, pressure and the, the mean velocity, uh, velocity over it. And um, then we can compare it to a very simple and very old model um, of uh, Constantopoulos and his group. And uh, as you can see, the, um, uh, the results are, um, yeah, quite, uh, are matching up pretty well with the, um, with the reference. So in blue and green, you have the inflow on the other channel and uh, the dashed lines are the references. So both velocity and also pressure drop can uh, yeah, be uh, modeled with that. However, that is just for um, a clean channel without any particles in there. So um, of course, as a next step, uh, a particle layer has to be added in there. Um, so we just put some particles in there that are supposed to uh, represent um, a layer that is already in, in breakup. Um, and uh, we calculated the 3D force distribution of them. Um, I mean, the general shape of uh, this distribution is probably not rather uh, um, surprising, 
um, but we can already see some differences um, since we um, change, uh, we distinguish between normal and tangential forces, uh, meaning um, drag and uh, lift forces in that case. And um, for example, for the normal forces, we see that uh, all the particles are shielding each other. And of course, uh, the tangential forces in a tow are a little bit higher. But um, what we can actually do with it is um, then we can um, set, for example, a force threshold um, that would keep the particles from uh, being detached and uh, be sus resuspended into the flow. And we can con um, connect this threshold to a very simple uh, reaction kinetics, for example, that it linearly decreases over time. And this is what um, you can see in the next simulation over, the, over here. So um, also we have like this uh, shortened, um, shortened channel in here. We place this uh, fragmented particle layer in there. Um, and then we were ramping up the fluid. Um, and now, unfortunately, you can't see it because it's not visualized, but the, re the reaction starts, meaning that the threshold for the force, uh, like uh, the detachment threshold is being uh, decreased. And eventually you can see that um, the particles with higher forces on them start to uh, be resuspended and are flying through the uh, channel. And uh, in the end, forming a plug in the, uh, in the channel end. However, it needs to be uh, noted that there is no collision model included so far. So of course, um, we, we're not having any realistic uh, plug formation in the end. However, the detachment can actually be shown. So um, I think that already uh, concludes my talk, to be honest. Um, so what I could show you that um, we could recover the basic flow in a clean wall flow channel, including the porous walls uh, by just modeling um, them. Um, we could extend this porous media model to uh, moving permeable uh, particles. Um, we were in including a very simplistic adhesion and reaction model. Um, and therefore, uh, yeah, we can actually simulate the detachment of this particle uh, of matter. Um, the following steps will be to have um, the pressure drop being compared to the numerous uh, experimental studies that we have in the literature. There's a ton of data that we can compare. Uh, the simulations with. Um, we can, of course, compare the uh, used porosity model against different ones. For example, the one by Google, which would also include the um, actual porosity uh, next to the permeability in it. And um, we should, of course, include more sophisticated uh, reaction kinetics, uh, not something that's just being based on the um, on a linear uh, time evolution. And um, of course, uh, in order to form the plug in the end, we need to explicitly um, or to include some explicit particle collision modeling. However, right now, due to the um, to the uh, lubrication effect we have between the particles, um, they are not uh, sticking or like um, going into each other, anyways. So at least we can uh, simulate this particle detachment. So. Um, Thank you for your attention. And as uh, Stefan did before, I want to also place this ad um, for the fifth spring school, which will be held in Greenwich, and um, which gives another opportunity to get in touch with the uh, Lettuce Boltzmann community. Let's open it up to questions. Um, I have a question. So, when you gave the talk, uh, you mentioned briefly uh, something about oxidation in the yeah. cleaning process, right? Mm -hmm. um, what exactly does that refer to? Uh, because you have uh, mainly soot in um, the uh, in the exhaust, um, and that is um, being um, deposited in the channels. So there is uh, that, that forms a big layer. So and um, that has to be oxidized periodically in order to remove it again. And then it will just um, go over to a gaseous phase and then just uh, vanish out of that um, channel. But still, um, before that happens, it can be uh, detached and uh, move around. And also there's, um, I, I wanted to keep it brief, but uh, there's also ash included in that, which is not actually being able to be oxidized. And that moves as well. So the filter can actually clog before it should, and uh, which would, 
um, yeah, decrease the whole efficiency of the filter. So these uh, soot particles that you're talking about, they're of much bigger than the pore sizes in your channel? Yeah, yeah, much bigger, much bigger. Okay, that's why you can model them as something that sits sort of on the outside of yeah, of exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, of course, okay. of course, the particles them, the particles themselves that are um, coming in there, of course, they're way smaller. But once they form this uh, layer and they break off, you have this really big clusters of um, different particles, and that can actually move in the channel and clog it eventually. Mm -hmm. So for the unclogging process, you kind of reverse the flow direction. Yeah, we could probably do that. Yeah, but but we're not usually you're not doing that. You're just oxidizing it, and then it becomes uh, uh, the suit um, goes into the gases phase and just moves uh, through the suit. Yeah. Because during okay. operation, it's quite hard to to reverse the flow, of course. Okay. Okay. So you just basically reduce the stickiness of the particles, essentially. Yeah. Exactly. And make them shrink eventually as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a that's a very interesting problem. Um, are there any other questions? Well, also, no other question. Let's thank Nicholas again. And uh, we move on to the uh, next talk from uh, Stefan Zietz. Um, Stefan, do you want to unmute your microphone? Yes, yes, uh, Stefan Zietz. Yes, yes. Yes, good. So, uh, do you want to try to share your screen? Um, does it work? Okay. Uh, work oh. for a second, but now it's... Right. I can I do it again. Present here for Okay. okay. Yep, yep, now it's working. Now can you see, I can see my screen, but, but you can probably yes, see can my screen. screen. I can see myself in your screen. <laughs> okay. Ah, there we go. That's your talk. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so Stefan Dietz is uh, working with, with Jens Harting, um, and he's going to tell us today about uh, stochastic sim film simulations with uh, dimensional reduced lattice Boltzmann model. Um, and that's out of where are you actually located in Allen? Um, our uh, premises is actually uh, still located in Nuremberg, but uh, okay. we are moving to Erlangen within some undefined time frame. <laughs> okay. okay, well, without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, thank you again, uh, first of all, for introducing me and uh, for doing this uh, event, although uh, we all have to fight Corona and cannot travel. Um, I, I honestly did look forward to this experience of uh, presenting online and just in front of my computer and, and not having uh, to talk with other people. It, it's it's kind of interesting, although uh, within these sad times. So I will uh, talk within the next uh, 18 minutes or so, I will talk about stochastic fin film simulation with a dimensionally reduced Lattice Boltzmann model. And I hope to explain this uh, long and convoluted title within uh, the few slides I have. Um, this is work done, of course, in, in collaboration. So with uh, Professor Jens Harting, who is the supervisor of my PhD thesis, and of course, a good friend of mine and uh, now located at the CNR in Rome, uh, Dr. Andreas Gagliarini. Um, the motivation for what we did or why we looked into the stochastic fin film equation is um, a rather complex one, I'd say. And, and instead of writing down a few thousand lines of, of words or equations, I'm, I'm just using an image because uh, it says more than a thousand words. And uh, I, choose the, I chose the, the clock or a watch because it's uh, some kind, uh, it, it, first of all, when, when we think of a watch, then, then we have to think of time, or, or how, we, how we get, uh, how we measure time. And when we think of time, there is, we usually have uh, too less of it, too little of it. Um, we always <laughs> need to prepare things in, in, in uh, like seconds or so, and, and it would be good if the day, uh, these days have like 30 hours to work on. Um, but in this uh, sense, in the sense of stochastic film films, um, 
it's, it's, it has a different meaning because uh, what was found already 13 years ago, uh, 17 years ago, I think, you know, uh, was that the stability of the thin film or the simulation of the thin films uh, was over predicted qu by quite a lot. So what, what was found is that the time scales of the experiments and the simulations did not match. In fact, the simulations over predicted the stability of the film by quite a lot. And of course you can say, mm, well, it's numerics. So yeah, we, we have the experiments, but um, if you are dependent on, on your simulations and if you have a coating and you want your coating to be uh, uniform and, and drying nicely, and then you want to have a, a film, a solid film or, or something like that at the end, then you, uh, for sure have a problem if you st if the stability of your film is not given if your film starts to divide and rupture and stuff like that so you want to understand that phenomenon so as Becker pointed out in, in this nice paper um, one reason why they thought that um, the experiments did not match with uh, sim their simulations was the ignorance of thermal fluctuations and uh, I think we, we had like uh, five talks already uh, saying things about the thermal fluctuations and how important they are for Navier-Stokes. And I think uh, this is also true for the thin film equation. And, and as I said, <clears throat> the other meaning of it that is uh, other meaning of the watch or the clock as a measure of time is uh, that we always have too little of it. So why we do simulations and, and not experiments uh, day by day is that our simulations can give us uh, results on a, on a shorter time scale than uh, performing complex uh, uh, experiments and uh, for that uh, due to that uh, due to the inherent parallelism of the lbm we uh, developed some uh, some method which can uh, simulate different films and runs on accelerated devices and uh, just as a just as a teaser for, for modern programming languages um, you don't actually need to know about CUDA that much uh, these days to, to write code which runs on the GPU. Um, here I would uh, use uh, videos, but of course, uh, since I'm doing this with uh, LaTeX, the, the, yeah, the Acrobat reader doesn't work. So I have them here and I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to start them uh, right now. Uh, one is the a thermal simulation and one is the thermal and I, okay this does not work one is with thermal fluctuations and you see that the, the a thermal it takes a time and then it flattens out and then it starts rupture while in the thermal the time scales are much shorter and okay this is uh, kind of broken i'll show you only the thermal you see that this is noisy and and all the time noisy and then ruptures really fast so, so this is on a, on a very short time scale and the whole video is just nine seconds while in the case of the a thermal uh, simulation started i'm gonna start show it from the beginning first of all it flattens out because of the laplacian and then it, this this takes ages so until the until the pressure gradient drives away the perturbation and it grows and it grows and then it ruptures but it's on a much longer time scale than in the a thermal case and now what what is the meaning behind this or what do we understand um so for the classical uh, thin film so what we what i called a thermal just now uh, we use the so-called thin film equation or we use something something similar but uh, behind this is the thin film equation which tells you that uh, your height field so so this blue thing you see here uh, can only move due to a pressure gradient so of course you have some some mobility because we are in the low reynolds regime so our reynolds number is fairly smaller than one and this is in, in principle this equation looks kind of simple but if you look into it then, then you find yourself uh, with mathematics and uh, fourth order degenerate partial differential equation so it's it's um, it's simple to write it down it's not so simple to solve it and it's uh, even harder to solve it numerically however um, as I pointed out this is uh, 
this equation does not uh, give us the correct rupture times or the uh, correct stability prediction for our film film. So, also here in Erlangen, Günther Grün and his uh, and Klaus Mecke and others, uh, and even Howard Stone at the same time, uh, came uh, to the idea that uh, maybe one can, uh, similar to the Navier-Stokes, uh, add a stochastic term, uh, so to say, thermal fluctuations to the game. And to do that, um, we find ourselves again with the with the fin film equation, but the the simple extension, so to say, the simple in the sense that it is possible, uh, it is it is hard, but it's possible to integrate out the stochastic uh, stress tensor in the in the third direction and the set direction, and then you 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 end up with something complicated. But uh, so so the main part of this work was that um, this complicated term then approaches the same Fokker-Planck equation as uh, this single multiplic uh, multiplicative noise which is written down here. So again, the normal energy, some mobility, and uh, Gaussian white noise. And then uh, when you put this in your simulation, you see, okay, here I have a well-defined wavelength, right? This is kind of smooth and follows roughly one dominant wavelength, while here the surface is much more corrugated, it's, it's, uh, it has a much finer uh, length scale, so to say. And we simulate this, we, we try to simulate this uh, kind of problem with the Lattice Boltzmann uh, method, and we, we heard in these two days uh, quite a lot about the Lattice Boltzmann method, and a very nice introduction uh, of 30 years Lattice Boltzmann from Professor Suchi. Um, so I will not go into detail too much here. Um, I'm just going to state that, of course, the lattice Boltzmann equation lives uh, based on the, on the kinetic equation, the Boltzmann equation, where we have a distribution. Usually one thinks of, a, of an ideal gas, and this is uh, this can either move by, by momentum, because this, this uh, for example, this, this gas, gas this particle has some uh, temperature, some thermal energy, or I can use some, some external forces due to magnetic fields, gravity, electric fields, uh, concentration gradients. So, and on the, on the right hand side, we have uh, the fairly complex uh, collision uh, term, or collision integral. Now, from this to Lattice Boltzmann, we need to, to do like a few steps. First of all, we need to discretize our space and time. This is the, the easy part, this we need to do anyway for all of our um, numerical methods. Then, why uh, Lattice Boltzmann, and I believe this is the, for me, this is the reason why, why Lattice Boltzmann is such a great thing. Then we can do a discretization of our lattice speeds. And uh, com as compared to other uh, methods, it is sufficient to use a finite set, uh, actually. And then I plot here the, the ones uh, I came across with my for my PhD, so I usually uh, do my uh, simulations in D2Q9, but of course uh, in, in our group um, we also use the D3Q19. And if you take all this into account and simplify the condition curl, you end up with this uh, nice and simple equation uh, written down here, where we have a distribution, this Fi, and this Fi uh, is either streamed to the next lattice point or, uh, and of course, a collided and with a single relaxation time in my case to the equilibrium. And uh, if you want or if you have to, you can apply forces to this uh, algorithm as well. Now, we all look forward to the talk uh, after mine, I think, uh, where, where Tim is uh, telling us more about uh, the fancy advances uh, in the Lattice Boltzmann method. And um, uh, using this simple BGK approach, we know that within the limit of small Mach and Knudsen number, we recovered the Lattice Boltzmann. Um, so the problem of, of uh, thin films is that we actually don't need to, to use the full Navier-Stokes equation, but it's, it is sufficient to, to do this in two dimensions. So instead of using the equilibrium distribution for Navier-Stokes, we use the equilibrium distribution of uh, another class of Lattice Boltzmann uh, um, simulations, uh, solutions, the, the so-called uh, shallow water Lattice Boltzmann. 
the, the main point here is instead of a, of a density, of a fluid density everywhere, we integrate out in Z and therefore have a height field everywhere. So, so this is this uh, shaded area here over some substrate. And, and you find it uh, as well in the equilibrium distribution. Now, this uh, expansion is the uh, same as for Navier-Stokes, up to second order in velocity. And to close the system, we assume not an ideal gas, but we use the hydrostatic pressure. Now, on top of this, so this works for the for the shallow water, or would work for the shallow water, but we are not interested on a, on a, on a lake at rest a simulation, but we are interested in thin films. So we need to account for, first of all, substrate interactions and, of course, of our curvature term. And this is done with a capillary uh, pressure term, where we have some potential, some wetting potential or disjoining pressure, how you like to refer to it, and a term which punishes our interface with the surface tension. So the principally, you can use the curvature, but it's, uh, as we found out, it's sufficient to use the Laplacian here. Now, as I said, uh, substrate uh, fluid interaction, we encounter in our friction term. Actually, if you set theta, which is some kind of a regularizing parameter, the slip length, if you set this uh, delta to zero, then you end up with a no slip, the inverse of a no slip boundary condition. And our wetting potential uh, is simply some power law potential, uh, po yeah, power law potential, which is uh, quite which is used quite often in these uh, kind of simulations. And we include, of course, the effect of our equilibrium angle in here. Now, wh why do we do this? What, what are the benefits of this, uh, instead of using the fin film, is because we believe that uh, strength lies in simplicity. So the lattice Boltzmann approach is fairly easy to code. I think I remember it was a few tens of lines to include the Shenzhen models. So with that, you can do quite a lot. Um, we make use of this. We put our algorithm on the GPU. We don't need to have a computing cluster. We know that the meshing is trivial and unusual by this Boltzmann, and we don't have to think of fancy triangulation. And on top of it, what we get for free is that this uh, approach is rather flexible, in, in including substrate interactions, like uh, equilibrium contact angle, and as I will show you, thermal fluctuations. So when we think about thermal fluctuations with lattice Boltzmann, we usually think of um, multi-relaxation time. However, when we use multi-relaxation time, um, we need to ask ourselves how we fine-tune these multi-relaxation times. And as it turns out, this is not uh, not not really straightforward all the time. I know that we don't need to care about all of the nine, but um, at least three or four of them need to be um, fine-tuned to our problem. And it was uh, and on top of it, it was shown that tampering with these ghost modes in, in this uh, shallow water approach can lead to density instabilities um, by Paul Della. Now, how do we? How, how our idea was okay. We believe in simplicity, so why not use the BGK? This is what we do, and add our thermal fluctuation as a force. This we can do because we have the thermal, uh, the stochastic fin film equation, and then we map our system uh, to this uh, thermal uh, stochastic fin film equation by including a force in our lattice Boltzmann. And this force looks pretty much like the, the term you saw for the fin film, because again, we have the friction term, some, some Gaussian white noise, and uh, dependence on the thermal energy. And what we plot here is, is so-called zero test, if, if this idea makes sense or, or is bogus, where we have in the full line this uh, theoretical solution to the deterministic case, and in the dashed line, the theoretical solution to the stochastic case for two times, actually, and the points are our, our simulation results. I agree, they are scattered, but this is so. For this straight line, we use a constant S0, which is given here. So this is simply the correlation of the height function. We use a constant one, while in the simulation, we use a random initialization. So this is the remin remnants of this initialization. However, we are pretty good with uh, catching the Q0, the, the most unstable wave mode, and the critical wave mode, where, where all the wave modes are damped out. If we go to the results of the stochastic one, we see that uh, our simulation fit much nicer on the, on the curve. Of course, here they are averaged, 
So we, we need a set of simulations. Here we just performed one. And what is not so nice here, but I'll show you later on, uh, is, the, is that we can fit our uh, simulation, uh, this, this maximum moves. So with this, we are quite happy that we can see that this stochastic part is actually recovered in our simulation. But this is not, but this is like a zero ground truth. So what we did next was we looked at our droplet distribution. And what we know is that when we have a system that is divetting like this, it will move to this state. It will form droplets, right? And in, the, in T to infinity, it will form one droplet. However, this droplet correlation within some, some median time needs to be correlated with our maximum wavelength. Because like uh, before, we, we have this Q zero, which is like the um, differential of our disjoining potential. And we know that one half of it is the droplet state, one half of it is the whole, one half is the droplet. So we know that this wavelength needs to be correlated with our height of the droplet by pure geometry. And we calculated this. And for a given contact angle, we came up with a solution. And this was also observed by Condage. And here is what we, what we take out from our simulations is that our droplet distribution for the, for the deterministic case is peaked very much, very narrow peaked around this uh, single height. While for the, 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 uh, but for the stochastic, we see that this is much broader. And what was, what was fairly interesting is that um, droplets are moving to smaller heights, so, so higher energetic states because it's more surface area. Now, going back, so after performing these tests, we are coming back to the uh, question of time scales. And this is actually something what we what is new to this whole game is uh, what, 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 what we extend, what we know of, is that um, when the film is rupturing, so when this, uh, this height goes to zero, we measure the time here in, in lattice Boltzmann time scale and lattice Boltzmann time steps based on the contact angle. And what we found out is that the that our deterministic simulation, so the blue dots, um, are always on top. and, and remember, this is logarithmic, are always on top of our stochastic simulations. Now, this is, of course, inversely proportional to the equilibrium angle. So the, the less wettable my substrate, the faster it divides. And what, what was uh, rather interesting or intriguing to us is that this difference depends, actually, this is the inset, depends on the contact angle. So the difference decreases based on the contact angle, which is However, intuitive in the sense that when you have a, a super hydrophobic substrate with a contact angle of 180 degrees, then there should not be a difference between uh, the stochastic and the deterministic uh, equation. And these two points here are actually something that is uh, done on a pattern substrate, which I will show you in a second. And instead of using a single contact angle, I used, uh, oh, we performed simulations with a contact angle, a uh, space dependent contact angle. And first of all, we used a sine wave because it's easy to simulate, most of all. <coughs> and our substrate, and what we see is that our height field follows this substrate uh, quite nicely. It, wet, it, it flows to the region of low contact angle and uh, divets regions of high contact angle. And the deterministic equation follows uh, perfectly the substrate. And here is this uh, structure factor. So we see the wave mode of the substrate, the second uh, harmonic, the third harmonic, and uh, the Q0 is like negligible in the sense. However, if we include thermal fluctuations, we not as clearly see anymore this, this uh, substrate. And later on, I, I, I cannot see the substrate anymore, I honestly tell you. Nevertheless, the, the scales are here much larger, so a magnitude larger. And as I told you, the, for the structure factor, we see the wave mode of the substrate, but already the second is not nicely seeable. However, the maximum goes to the left. Now, now we thought, okay, this is this is numerics, but uh, for for experiments, you you have junctions usually. There is like a, there is a contact angle and there is a contact angle because there is a defect. So we use the square wave substrate to, to look into this problem again, and what we uh, found out was that okay, there is no more difference between the deterministic and the stochastic in the sense that the that you don't identify this from the structure factor. However, if you go to the region where the film ruptures, then you see you can plot a line through all the rupture events of the 
of the uh, deterministic, while in the stochastic we have a broad range of rupture events, which you can actually hear, but I was not able to include the wave file in this. And, and here is the uh, distribution of these rupture events, where we, we see again as a, as a delta like peak for the deterministic uh, simulation, while for the uh, set of stochastic equation we see a broad distribution of these rupture events. And since I'm already over time, as far as I know, um, I'm gonna. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for that. I'm, I'm just gonna uh, throw at you the summary. Like uh, we we hope that our model is consistent with thermal fluctuations, or we think. Um, we saw a dependence on the contact angle for the rupture times, and the patterning uh, drives the dynamics of our uh, simulations. And with this, I'd like to thank you for this. Um, conference and and uh, gonna give the word back to you thanks for nice talk i thought that for me one or two very good questions i i have one question um when you're comparing the um noisy and the non-noisy one particularly for a flat interface um wouldn't that be a strong depends on the initial noise that you need to have in the deterministic one? Because if you have a completely flat surface, it would, I mean, once you have a pattern, yes, it would break, but for the flat surface, it would break up at all, right? Um, so, yes, you're right. Um, so if you have a perfectly flat uh, interface, then you don't have a pressure gradient, right? And then nothing would happen and for the deterministic. I mean, mm -hmm. could be that it's, I mean, there, there's, of course, numerical noise, right? It is, um, so, so there's, a, there's a, a floating point number. So it could be that within years of, of simulation, this would break, but in principle, there should, happening, there should not be happening anything for the mm -hmm. deterministic. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Is there none? Then let's just thank Stefan again. And uh, Tim, are you there? I, I don't see you here. Ah, oh, there you are, Tim. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Okay. Um, just looking for my presentation. You okay. should see my slides, I guess. Yeah, coming up. Excellent. Yep, excellent. Okay, and so this brings us to. Uh, the last talk of, of this session uh, by Tim Kruger, who's, uh, well, to me, he's famous for being a graduate of Bielefeld University, which has an unlikely, <laughs> unlikely generation of uh, uh, ESFD related uh, or, or CSD simulation related research, it seems though there wasn't much going on in that area at the time. Um, but most, most recently, of course, he's, he's known to everyone as the author of the Dennis Bosman method. Uh, book and uh, all my students refer to the Kruger book whenever they they're trying to settle the dispute or questions and want to look things up. So um, he's been known for, for writing this, uh, I think, very timely book to give a uh, accessible introduction to all things that is false money. He, he, he led an um, impressive team of, of uh, very good researchers who, who've written this, I think, by now standard book on, on the Redis Forsman method. Um, but today, is going to talk about um, inertial effects in deterministic lateral displacement areas um, with, with uh, reduce the particle separation size. Um, and without further ado, I'll just pass it on to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Alexander. First of all, can you see my mouse moving? Yes, I can. Because, uh, okay, yes, can. I mean, that's, that's extremely helpful. Right. I want to talk about something relatively simple today compared to the last plenary talk we had about colliding neutron stars, which is basically a combination of everything that physics has to offer. But uh, in this presentation, uh, I want to focus on a relatively simple system. It's um, also a physics talk. I don't focus so much on lattice Boltzmann. And this particular project, uh, uh, we started that about one year ago, and uh, Callum Mallory, who is also in the audience here, he is uh, one of our undergraduate students, and he did a summer project last year 
And we thought, uh, why don't we look at uh, this particular device, lateral displacement, deterministic lateral displacement, at finite inertia? And I will get back to that. Rohan, he's also here in the audience. Um, he has run all the simulations that I will show you today. And uh, David Inglis is an experimentalist based in Sydney, and he came over for about five months to Edinburgh. And in that time, he, I wouldn't say he learned Lattice Boltzmann, but he definitely learned how to use the Lattice Boltzmann code, which is fantastic. Okay, I want to talk about inertial effects in DLD arrays and uh, what these inertial effects can do. A very brief motivation, why are we looking at these devices? The ultimate aim is to diagnose diseases, and that very often means to separate and detect particles, for example, circulating tumor cells or maybe bacteria or all kinds of particles that you may find in biological samples, in particular in blood. Uh, here at the top left, you can see a few blood cells, a red blood cell, a white blood cell, and a platelet. Uh, bacteria are relatively small, comparable to a platelet, maybe, order one micrometer. Circulating tumor cells are more like a white blood cell, 15 to 20 micrometers, maybe. And the idea is to move towards the so-called lab on a chip, which means you take a small blood sample and you put it on a chip and the microfluidic geometry designed in a way, in a way that it actually um, drives particles in different directions based on lift forces and um, confinement effects and whatever. Deterministic lateral displacement or DLD is one particular device idea that uh, usually is operated in the Stokes limit where the Reynolds number is small to separate particles by size. And here the ideas are the following. If you have an array of obstacles with a gap in between, and this gap is called G, um, and you have a flow that is slightly tilted with respect to the array axis. If you look carefully, the array axis, maybe I can use the drawing tool. The array axis is the x-axis, but the flow is slightly tilted and there's an angle, as you can see here. Um, now, as a consequence, you can find streamlines that end up in um, a downstream post at some point. And if you follow this streamline back, it passes the upstream post in a given distance, which you can see here, it's called beta. And the idea is uh, very, very simple. If you have a particle that is small enough to fit into this streamline here, basically, then it will follow the flow and go between two posts in lateral direction here. But bigger particles, uh, they will continue um, forward in um, the direction of the x-axis, which is the array axis, because these particles are forced by the posts and they cannot enter this gap here. And this works very well. And you can see in an experimental image here that um, the green particles are very small fluorescent beads and they essentially follow the flow in a straight direction. And larger particles, which are red, they are bumped at each post and they follow the array inclination. And uh, in this particular case, the angle between green and red is uh, the angle alpha here, roughly. Now, there are various design parameters, as you can imagine. You can have different post shapes. You can have different distances between the posts. You can have even different post arrangements. In this particular case, it's a square layout, as you can see. Um, and of course, you can also operate the device differently. You can, for example, once you have the device, once it's fabricated, you can just increase the pressure drop to boost the Reynolds number. And that is particularly important for high throughput devices. If you imagine you have a microfluidic chip and you want to process a few milliliters of blood, then you have to pump quickly in order to get this done in a relatively short time. And this is one of the reasons why people are interested in high Reynolds number. And high Reynolds number means uh, still in the steady regime, maybe up to Reynolds number 100, but you definitely have quite, quite some inertial effects here. The key question is for this kind of device, for a given device layout and a given operation mode, Reynolds number, what is actually the distance of the streamline um, to the post? 
uh, basically what is the distance here because this determines the critical diameter of particles that get separated effectively. Um, now, this is a bit oversimplified because everything that I told you um, is based on the assumption that you have particles in the flow. And uh, of course, nobody would run a DLD device without any particles inside. But ironically, most people actually run computer simulations of DLD devices without particles, and they just look at the flow field, in particular at the shape of this technation streamline here. And then the assumption is that this distance is telling you everything about the separation characteristics. As you know, particles deform the flow and therefore you will have secondary effects and the particles will not exactly just follow a streamline. Uh, but this is nothing I want to talk about today. Indeed, I want to follow this very crude simplification um, and uh, just investigate the flow field here. So, there is a problem that can happen and um, that is called anisotropy, and I will explain that in more detail. If you imagine you have a device on the left, top left here, where you have, for whatever reason, a gap in your array. You have an array on the left and the right, and the flow goes, the flow goes from the left to the right. Depending on how your posts are arranged, for example, with a square layout or a rhombic layout, which is slightly different, you can see that the streamlines have a different shape. And that is actually undesired. What you would like to have, if you imagine you have an inlet somewhere here, you have an outlet here, you would like to have ideally fluid streamlines that are essentially straight. Of course, they have to go around the obstacles, but you would like to have a streamline going um, as straight as possible around the obstacles. And if you look very carefully at the top right, you can see the streamline is tilted with respect to the horizontal red line that indicates something parallel to the wall. And if you now change the shape of your posts, which you can do for whatever reasons, you can have a much, much stronger tilt of streamlines. And that is extremely undesired for these devices. You can see it in an experiment. These are actually fluorescent um, signatures of very small particles that are expected to go horizontally through the device, but obviously they don't. And um, that is really, really bad for application of these devices because you cannot rely on where the, where the particles actually go, which means we have to understand where this kind of behavior comes from. And for this particular case where the Reynolds number is small, the so-called anisotropy that leads to the tilt of streamlines is explained by the arrangement of the posts and the shape of the posts. And we published this in Laponet Ship about three years ago. What is anisotropy? If you think about an array of obstacles and you have an incoming flow, and this flow is tilted with respect to this array by an angle alpha, which is typically very small for these devices. We're talking about two to five, maybe up to 10 degrees or something, but not more. Then three things can happen. If you measure the total force acting on one of these posts due to the flow, this force can be parallel to the imposed flow. In this case, we just have a drag force and we don't have a lift force, and we would say there's no anisotropy. But there, there are two other cases. One where the lift is pointing, uh, you have a net force that is pointing perpendicular to the flow in upwards direction. In this case, we define the lift to be positive, or it can point in the other direction, and we define the lift to be negative. And the anisotropy is nothing more than a dimensionless version of the lift force. It's the lift force divided by the drag force and an isotropic device. It doesn't depend on how you um, uh, how your flow comes into the device. The drag force will always be completely uh, sorry uh, parallel to the flow. You don't have any lift, and anisotropy is zero by definition. And we would like to have devices that are isotropic because then we don't get unexpected tilts of the flow and the streamlines. The question is, why do we get anisotropy in certain cases? I said already, post shape and post arrangement can play a role even at small Reynolds number, but uh, we want to investigate the finite Reynolds number case. And of course, if you have more inertia in your system, you, you will get different flow features and therefore you may have anisotropy in your system. And while lift force is very important for many applications in industry, uh, think of a plane. A plane would never be able to fly without a lift force, which is a desired force. 
uh, in our case, we would like to reduce the lift force. And uh, on this slide, I have everything that we need to know about uh, the geometry and also the method. Uh, that's uh, everything you find about Lettice Boltzmann here. There are actually two research questions here. The first one is, how does inertia affect the critical diameter of the particles in the device? Um, you remember that the critical diameter is related to the distance between the stagnation streamline and a post, which is called beta. And the other question is, how does inertia affect the anisotropy in the device? For the geometry, we fixed the inclination angle, the incoming attack angle of the flow to three degrees. And uh, we also use circular posts and a square layout, which means that at Reynolds number zero, the anisotropy is also zero. We know that for sure. Uh, the Reynolds number is varied between 0 and 80, and the gap size divided by the periodicity length of the system is between 10 and 60 percent. In terms of methods, so that's really everything I want to say about Lettice Boltzmann here. Uh, 2D simulations, which is a good enough approximation because we have a relatively flat system, and the width and length of the system are the important scales here. Uh, we simulate two by two posts rather than a single post with uh, periodic boundary conditions, uh, the results are exactly the same as for one by one post, but it's easier to visualize when you use ParaView because you don't have to multiply your flow field and the simulations are quite fast. For the obstacle boundary conditions, we use a simple bounce back, which is good enough because we have a relatively high resolution. Uh, typically, the post diameters are maybe about uh, 70 lattice nodes or so. Um, the staircase effect is not very strong. We have a force driven flow periodic boundary conditions, and now this is a key, uh, there's a lateral constraint of the flow. And let me go back to sketch here. Um, we force the flow to be along the axis N1. And in reality, what we would have is we would actually have walls far away that are also tilted by an angle alpha. And because in reality, these walls are impermeable, there cannot be any flow component along the N2 axis if your system is fully periodic up to the wall region, uh, which means we need to enforce no flux on average along the N2 axis. That is uh, something we achieve by having an additional force that is varied until we get the no flux condition along the N2 axis. What we get in terms of results, uh, that is a typical flow field for uh, of 30% and Reynolds number one. And uh, the angle of pack is three degrees, as I told you, and you can see two stagnation points on one of the posts. One is uh, an incoming stagnation, point, the other one an outgoing stagnation point. And if you follow the streamline from the stagnation point upstream, you see it passes at the upstream pillar at a given distance beta, right? Uh, and all streamlines in between, they must go between the two posts because there is a net component of the flow going down. If we increase Reynolds number, a first vortex is forming, but the amount of flow going through the pillars is still the same as before by design because we enforce the angle for the flow. And if we increase Reynolds number further, the first vortex grows, but it can never touch the next post or get close to it because we still need this bit of flux go through the gap between the two posts, no matter how big the Reynolds number is. And we also get a second vortex um, at the back of the post. Now, in terms of results, um, the first question, how does uh, the velocity profile between two posts change? Because this determines how beta looks like. Uh, this is what we find. We find a velocity profile that is successively tilted to the bumping post on the right with increasing Reynolds number, which means that the fraction of the flow that goes between the posts, which is roughly one over 19 for an angle of three degrees, um, the fraction of that flux is carried by a width of the flow that is getting narrower and narrower. If you imagine that the flow is tilted towards one of the posts, then uh, the integral up to beta uh, requires a smaller value of beta, the more you are tilted. And this means that the critical particle diameter decreases with increasing Reynolds number. And therefore, if you have a given device constructed for a given particle diameter and you operate it at a, diff at a different Reynolds number, you will definitely see a different critical separation of the particles, which may be desired or not. 
and here is the data. Uh, you see um, that for very small gaps in the Stokes regime, the Poisson profile is a very good assumption. For larger gaps, it is not really a good assumption because of the flow never has the time to fully develop between the posts. And if you increase Reynolds number, in all cases, your gap size, sorry, your uh, critical particle diameter decreases. That is one of the key observations. But now what is really interesting, and um, I think I have to hurry because of time, this is uh, the anisotropy in the system. To remind you, in the Stokes limit, which you have on the left here, where the Reynolds number is basically zero, we would expect no anisotropy, and the measured angle of the force vector acting on a post should be exactly parallel to the imposed velocity vector. The velocity vector is imposed at three degrees in all cases, and you can see that the resulting force vector is indeed at three degrees, which means that there's no anisotropy in the small Reynolds number regime. That is nice. If you have a large gap and you increase Reynolds number, you see that the force vector is rotating even farther away from the horizontal, which means if you would let the flow go, then it would align with um, the array uh, axis. And this is actually something that um, Tony Ladd, our old colleague and friend, has already published 23 years ago. This is completely expected because of the flow resistance along um, the main axis of this kind of pillar array is smaller than in any other direction. And the, force would, uh, the flow would like to follow a trajectory that minimizes resistance. Now, what is something that we are a bit puzzled about, and this is a work in progress, we don't really know what uh, the explanation is, for very small gaps between 10 and 30 or 40 percent, you see that the flow would first tilt away from the array axis, which means you get a negative anisotropy, and after some time, anisotropy increases again, and it may or may not become positive, depending on how far you go on the Reynolds axis. And that is an effect here that, uh, to the best of our knowledge, hasn't been described. And you may say, well, it's a very small effect. We are talking about one degree deflection. Don't forget that we are already at a three degree deflection. And if you have a one degree mistake, you have a 30% error in your de design, basically. So it is very important to understand what is happening here for the sake of applicability of these microfluidic devices. And uh, at the last slide, what, uh, what I try to do is I try to look at the uh, lift forces around the post. If you if you look at a post here and you go around the surface, you can of course look at the lift force contribution on each point on the surface, which we get from the flow field. Um, and the, the most important observation is that the vortices that you can see in the flow field, they actually have no effect whatsoever on the lift force. You would not, by looking at the lift force itself, be able to see where the vortices are. And uh, here you can see the pressure profile around the post. To us, it is currently unclear why uh, we have this kind of very small and negative anisotropy um, that first becomes more negative and then increases again towards zero and positive values. And that is something um, that is unanswered and still important for the applicability of these devices. Just to summarize, um, we are looking at the inertia of um, inertial effects in deterministic lateral displacement devices uh, in order to enable higher throughput for these microfluidic separators. In particular, we have seen that the critical particle size uh, for the separation decreases with increasing Reynolds number, which is actually not a new result. This has been described before. Uh, but what is a new result is that the anisotropy uh, is a function of Reynolds number, but a complex function of Reynolds number, or a complicated function. And it is unclear to us why this is happening. So if anyone has any ideas, so that would be fantastic. And of course, we know that the particles would change everything in the moment you have particles inside. And we actually look at these cases as well, but um, we decided not to present that today. It will be in a future conference. Thank you very much for your attention and also thanks for the sponsors, so European Commission and uh, EPSSC. Thank you. Thank you for that nice talk, Tim. Um, let's, open, let's open it up to questions.
So if I may, I'm allowed mm -hmm. to ask a question. Yeah, Can you please. go back to, to slide 12? Um, so you said, uh, so this, this result that the flow would um, coincide with the axis of the array is, is known from, from this lead paper. What uh, is the inclination of this uh, angle? Um, okay, the flow um, in, in the lead paper, what they do, they actually impose the force direction and they let the flow direction evolve. In our case, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, we impose a flow, a velocity vector that is on average three degrees rotated with respect to the array axis. And uh, this is what we get out of the simulation, of course. It's imposed and this is, of course, what we observe. But um, the point is, for example, if you take uh, this point here where the um, force angle is six degrees roughly, if you remove the constraint of the velocity of the flux to be zero along the N2 axis, if there were no side walls, then um, as a consequence, the flow would actually tilt towards the array axis, uh, which we have not explicitly tested, but this is what would happen. And uh, that is well known. I mean, these two curves here for G 0 0.6 and 0 0.5, this is uh, very much in agreement with what um, Koch and Lett wrote in their paper. What is completely unclear is why the anisotropy first becomes negative in the small gap regime. Uh, the lubrication theory actually predicts no anisotropy whatsoever, but then again, lubrication theory is not really valid at Reynolds number 40, uh, which means we are somewhere in a transition regime where it is unclear what is really happening. Thank you, thanks. Are there other questions? I, I actually had one, but uh, I want to give priority to anybody else who might have one. So, Tim, in your uh, streamlines, they, they seem to suggest that you have steady flow, right? But presumably at some Reynolds number, you're going to get unsteady flow, right? And that may yes. actually depend on initial conditions as well. So, so where would you start to see the unsteady flow? Uh, typically, I think for a single post, you would see it uh, without any post nearby. It's about Reynolds number 40. Uh, it also depends a bit on the definition of the Reynolds number, uh, because, of course, different people define it differently. And I would have to look it up how our Reynolds number definition compares to uh, the literature definition for a freestanding post. Uh, but in our case here, the simulations are steady state. And in the koch -Lett paper, for example, if they have unsteady simulations, so they report the average values, averaged over one period. But that would probably make a big difference to what particles would do, right? Uh, sure, but I don't want to have unsteady flow, uh, because uh, then, of course, uh, the particle separation is completely, uh, it's not deterministic anymore. What you want to have, you want to have deterministic particle particle separation, which means that the background flow field should be steady. Otherwise, it's getting messy. And there may be some applications where it's useful, but for this kind of application, you want to have steady flow, steady background flow. Mm. Uh, my second question was, you said that you sort of implicitly induce boundaries by uh, imposing the net, well, no net flow in this channel direction. Yes. Uh, yes. But does that mean when you have actual walls in there that you get things that are actually anisotropic in the sense that things closer to those walls would behave a little bit differently than... If it's in the uh, yeah, so if you, yeah. if you look again, for example, at the top left, um, these are simulations Rohan has run. Uh, I don't know exactly how many posts these are, but uh, all of these are resolved posts in the simulations. And so we had a huge lattice in 2D, but in 2D you can do that, it's easy. Uh, and we saw that I think up to maybe five or six unit cells away from one wall, you could see the effect of the wall. But typically you are interested in what's happening farther away from the wall, which means you need to find a way to simulate a periodic system, but still the effect of the wall has to be retained. And uh, the best way of doing that is exactly what I explained, where you have a periodic boundary condition, but you impose a no flux in the normal direction of the wall. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank Tim and all the other speakers of, of the session again.
Thank you. And that uh, will then close the uh, session for today. And we'll see you all back. Well, not me, because I'm in the US and <laughs> it's way too early, but otherwise tomorrow morning in, uh, for, for, the, for the Wednesday session. Um, OK, um, thanks very much. And uh, it's good to see so many familiar faces, at least briefly. And I, you know, it'd be nice to be hang out and talk a little bit. But uh, I guess the, this is all kind of organized on the fly. It'd be great to find some way of having sort of breakout sessions where you can just go and do the coffee times and chat with people. But uh, I guess that's something we still have to figure out how to do well. OK, with that, um, depending where you are, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> And um, ha have a great rest of the day. Yeah. Thanks, Alexander. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.